for a very long time. But there is something I would like for you to see from this text. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. It is a very familiar passage of Scripture in the sense that many people know that it exists, although we do not read it or refer to it often in church, but it is very familiar in that people know that it's in their Bible. It's Paul giving advice to his son in the ministry, Timothy, about how to select qualified deacons or qualified servants. While it seems that it's directed specifically to people that we refer to as deacons, there's something in the text that is beneficial to the entire church as a whole. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. The text says, Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double tongued. I love that word. To be double tongued just simply means to give two interpretations of the same facts. It means to tell one person one thing and to tell somebody else something different. The text says that deacon should not be double tongued or addicted to much wine. Are fond of sordid gain, but holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips. <laughs> That's funny because some women said, I don't gossip as much as men do. <laughs> but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife. <laughs> <laughs> and good managers of their children <laughs> and their own household. <clears throat> if you can't run your house, children, you can't run nothing in here. Amen. If she runs you at home, she go dictate what you do in here. And ain't nobody go dictate what happens in here but the word of God. Come on now. Take it plain. He must be the husband of one wife. He must rule over his children well. He must be a good manager of his children in his own household. For those who serve well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. It's leadership that makes a difference. That's the title of this sermon, Leadership that makes a difference. You may have the seats, thank you very much. Ushers, you certainly too kind. Leadership that makes a difference. Allow me to preface the sermonic presentation by giving you the background of the text. The book of 1 Timothy is written by Paul to his young protege Timothy, who was representing Paul in the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus, or the church in the city of Ephesus, was surrounded by all kinds of ungodly activity. And in an attempt on the church's part to pull people out of the world, the church had fallen in. So much so that when people went to church to find out how to live for God, they only saw, they only saw a reflection of the world. Giving the assumption that God was okay with the behavior that was being displayed in the world. 
Therefore, Timothy, or Paul rather, picks up his pen and picks up his pad and begins to write to his young protege, Timothy, who was representing him in the city of Ephesus, to let Timothy know that while there is little to nothing that you can do about the world around you, there is something that you can do about the people in the world around you. If they come to the church looking for an example of how to live for God, you can give them the best example that you can provide for them if you have leaders who are living for God. But if people come to the church and see leaders who are not living for God, it gives the assumption that they can do whatever it is they want to do because that's what the leader is doing. Paul is trying to help Timothy know that good leadership will make a good difference. All right. It's leadership that makes a difference. Many of you may be familiar with the name Malachi Love Robinson. Maybe you don't know the name, but I'm sure you know the story. Malachi Love Robinson was a name that became known to the world after Florida police discovered that he was practicing or posing as a medical doctor. At 18 years of age, Malachi had rented an office out of which he was seeing people and giving them medical advice. Malachi was performing physicals, writing prescriptions, and doing everything that a doctor is qualified to do. However, Malachi did not have the necessary documentation to prove that he could provide or that he was qualified to provide the services that he was rendering. He was physically examining people. He was giving people medical advice. He was telling people that they needed to take this prescription and telling people that they needed to take that prescription. He was doing everything a doctor does, but he did not have the necessary documentation to prove that he was qualified to give the advice that he was giving. All right. Therefore, when people came to see Malachi about their medical condition, they often left the same way that they came because Malachi was not qualified to render the service that he was given. All right. I'll tell you that one more time. Yeah. Malachi was posing at 18 years of age. He was posing as a medical doctor. Unfortunately, people were going to his office to receive medical information. Mm -hmm. But when they arrived at his office, they often left his office in the same condition that they were in because Malachi was not qualified to provide the information that he was providing. All right. Likewise, it's been brought to my attention through my exegetical, theological, and homiletical homework of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, that many people are leaving the church the same way they came because leaders within the Christian community are unqualified to give them the information that they need. All right. Many people are coming to the church looking for spiritual guidance. Mm -hmm. Many people are coming to the church looking for physical guidance and they are coming to the church every Sunday, they're coming to Bible studies, they're coming to the church every time the door is open, but they often leave the same way they came because the leaders within the Christian community are unqualified to meet the needs that they came for. People come to church for all kinds of reasons. Some people come to church because they like to hear the choir sing. 
other people come to church because they like the sound that comes from the musical instruments that accompany the choir's voices. Some people come to church because they like to hear the preacher moan and hum. Some people like to come to church because they view the church as their own social club where they get to hang out with some of their dearest friends. People come to church for all kinds of reasons, but there are some people, believe it or not, who actually come to church because they want to know what God expects of them in their life. Yet they come to the church trying to figure out what God expects for, from them out of their life. They come to church trying to have their spiritual needs met. They come to church trying to have their physical needs met. But the sad reality of many churches within the, the, within the 21st century is that people often leave the church in the same condition that they came because the leadership within the Christian community is unqualified to service the needs that they came for. But I stood up this morning to let somebody in this sacred space we call sanctuary know that if this church and any church around the world is going to meet the physical and spiritual needs of the, of the people who come here looking to have their needs met, it requires that we have qualified men in positions who know how to give a godly example. It's leadership that makes the difference. A church with poor leadership will not make a bit of difference in the community that we serve. Who then? The text demands to know. Qualifies to care for the physical needs within the Christian community. Who qualifies to care for the physical needs within a local church? First Timothy chapter number three, verses eight through thirteen. The Apostle Paul provides general characteristics of people who qualify to care for the physical needs within a local church. First, the text teaches that men who are respected in their society qualify to care for the needs of a local church. Men, Christian men, who are respected in their society qualify to care for the needs of a local church. In verses 8, 9, and 10, Paul's imperatives suggest that qualified church leaders are men who are respected within their community. Specifically, verses 8 and 9 identifies qualified leaders as men who live for God because they trust in Jesus Christ. While this is a generalization, of all Christians. All Christians should live for God because we trust in Jesus Christ. This is a general statement for all Christians, but Paul specifies it toward deacons. The text says, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-toned, or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid gain. Who or what is a deacon? The word deacon comes from the Greek word dikonos. It literally means a servant. It's the picture of a person who waits tables. It's the picture of a person who is obligated to fulfill the needs of another without any consideration for themselves. You've been to a restaurant lately. Yeah. There was somebody who came and serviced you. They asked you what you wanted to drink. They asked you were you ready to order. They waited on you hand and foot. They made sure that you had everything you needed to enjoy your meal. Neither once did you hear them complain about their feet hurting. 
Neither once did you hear them complain about trouble that they were having in their own personal lives, and neither did you care. Hmm. All you wanted to know was, when my food go be ready? Yes. What's taking you so long to bring me my drink? I don't have any silverware to eat my meal. All you wanted was to be served, and the person serving you was only obligated to meet your needs, not their own. Mm -hmm. This is the idea of a deacon. A deacon is designed to meet the needs of other people with no regard for himself. If a person is more interested about themselves, they do not qualify to be a servant, neither do they qualify to be a servant in the household of God. All right. All right. Servants of God cannot be so consumed with what they have going on in their lives that they forget to do what God has saved them to do. All right. And that is to meet the needs of other people. Paul says... Deacons, they are Christian men who care for the needs of other people. But Paul gives some imperatives, some imperative characteristics that deacons must have. Again, let me say that while we're speaking specifically of the office of deacon. These characteristics should be a part of every Christian's life. First, Paul says in the text that deacons must be men of dignity. That is, a deacon must be an honorable man. A deacon must be an admirable man. A deacon should be a person that people look up to and want to follow what they do. All right. Churches are suffering because they do not have leaders that they can look up to. They must be dignified men. Men of dignity. They must be honorable men. They must be admirable man. But not only must they be honorable and admirable, Paul says they must not be double-tongued. That is, they tell you something and tell somebody something else. It literally means that they use the same facts to tell two different stories. You know this term, don't you? You often use the same facts to tell two different stories to benefit yourself. You tell your boss one thing. You tell the employee another. You use the same facts, but you tell two different stories. People who do this are looking out for their own benefit. And if you are going to be a servant, you cannot look out for your own benefit. You just have to state the facts the way they are to everybody you come in contact with. You've met people. So they told me this and that. So they told you that, they told me this. Mm -hmm. okay. It's the person who's being okay. double tough. They're giving two interpretations of the same facts to benefit themselves. Not only do you not qualify to be a deacon, but you don't even qualify to be called a child of God if that's what you do. Because God's children don't act like that. They don't look out for themselves. They look out for what's beneficial to God. Deacons must be men of dignity. They must not be double-tongued or they must not be addicted to much wine. Mm. 
Notice the context of the passage. People want to know, is it all right for Christians to drink? Can I have a sip every once in a while? Is that all right? The text says, not much wine. <laughs> Get the idea that Paul is trying to communicate and get the cultural context in which Paul is making the statement. The idea that Paul is communicating by saying not much wine is that Paul is not an advocate of people walking around intoxicated or drunk or cannot stand up on their own two feet. The cultural context of the passage is that during the biblical times, during the days that Paul was writing this text, they did not have all these water filters that we have today. So what they would do was they would mix some fermentated grape juice in with their water. It would be very diluted so they would not be intoxicated when they drunk it. Uh -huh. This is what he means when he says not much wine. He says use just enough to purify your water, but don't put too much in there that you forget that you are a child of God. All right. All right. All right. The idea that he's communicating is that Christians, especially deacons, should not be walking around with slurred speech. Otherwise, they would not be respected within their, in their society. They would be known as a drunk. And if you're known as a drunk, you cannot tell anybody about the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Amen. You cannot walk up to somebody talking about the grace of God and they got intoxicated off the smell of your breath. Amen. Right. Speak now. <laughs> Paul says, now, don't be given to much wine. Don't walk around drunk. Here's the thing. You say, well, that seems to me that I can have a drink. That's fine. But who drinks just to have a drink? No. No. You pick up something to drink, your intention is to turn the bottle up until there's nothing left. We don't have the same problem that they had. We have pure water. There's plenty of things to drink. Coke, Dr. Pepper, Sprite. Pick something else. If you, want, if you don't want to look hard, order you a Red Bull, have them put it in the glass. <laughs> You get what I'm saying. Yeah. The idea is that Christians should not walk around under the influence of uh, some alcoholic beverage. Especially those who, try, who are trying to be examples to the church about how to live their lives. If people come to the church and they see leaders intoxicated, it gives the impression that it's okay for them to be intoxicated. Should not be double tongued. They should not be addicted to much wine, and they should not be fond of sort of game. Simply means that they shouldn't spend their entire life trying to be become rich dishonestly. God is not against you being wealthy. He is against how you become wealthy. Notice the context of the passage. The first time we see an idea of a deacon is in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, the apostles have a job to teach the people. They have a job to pray and minister to the spiritual needs of the people. But the people also need their physical needs met. They need food and clothes. Mm -hmm. They need things to take care of their families. The apostles were doing all of this. 
But when the apostles realized that they needed to devote themselves to prayer in the study of the word so that they can minister to the spiritual needs of the people, they told the people to pick them seven men to look after the business of making sure that their physical needs were met. We need to worry about your spiritual needs, but you can pick you some men who can see after your physical needs. Mm -hmm. So people are coming and they're laying all of their possessions at once the apostles' feet, but now they're laying all of their possessions at what we have come to know as the deacon's feet. And what a sad day it would be if you had some deacons who were interested in being rich, that they, instead of helping the people, they were pocketing what the people brought. This is the indication that Paul is giving about not one who is interested in dishonest gain. Because if you are interested in gaining things dishonestly, you will not help the people that you are supposed to be helping. You will hurt them by taking from them to better yourself. The church needs deacons that it can trust to be honest with the people. Deacons likewise must be honorable men. The characteristics that fall after being men of dignity are there to support a man of dignity. A man of dignity is not double-tongued. A man of dignity is not given to much wine. A man of dignity is not interested in dishonest gain. A man of dignity is a man that demands my respect. If you cannot respect a man of dignity, I don't know who you can. If you cannot respect a man who has admirable characteristics, I don't know who you can respect. But if you do not have admirable characteristics, you don't deserve respect. Especially in the household of God. Speak now. In light of verses 8 and 9. But holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, says verse 9. A deacon must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. In other words, he must be saved. Amen. He must know who Jesus Christ is. And not only must he know who Jesus Christ is, the text says he must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Clear conscience there just simply means that he must have a complete understanding of right and wrong. Uh -huh. If he is going to be in charge of the physical needs of the people and people are coming to him to figure out what they need to do, he must understand what to do before he can tell somebody else what to do. If he doesn't understand what to do himself, he doesn't qualify to offer advice to anybody. Amen. Notice that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, it's the qualifications of an elder, a bishop, or a pastor. All of those are synonymous phrases. The qualifications of an elder, bishop, or a pastor are the same as the qualifications for a deacon with the exception of the ability to teach. Deacons are not expected to have the ability to teach, the gift to teach, the gift to preach. They're not expected to have that ability, yet they are expected to know what the preacher is preaching about because they share the same faith. A person, a leader, in the church, a leader in the Christian community who does not hold, does not have possession of the gospel of Jesus Christ and does not understand what people should do with the gospel of Jesus Christ is not qualified to teach anybody or to offer advice to anybody or to lead anybody because they don't know where they're going themselves. Mm. All right. Says they must hold the mystery 
The mystery refers to God's plan of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a mystery. How is God going to save the world? He's going to save the world through his son. He's going to wrap himself in the uterus of a virgin by the name of Mary. He's going to come himself and save the world. That was a mystery. But the leadership within the church ought to know the mystery and they ought to know what to do with the mystery. They ought to know the truth, they ought to know the gospel, and they ought to be able to instruct people in the gospel. Mm -hmm. This is what Paul does in the book of Philemon. In the book of Philemon, Paul uses the gospel to tell Philemon and Onesimus what they ought to do as children of God. The gospel is a gospel of grace. It is a gospel that says you ought to forgive. And that's exactly what Philemon was expected to do to Onesimus. He was expected to forgive him. Paul showed practical application of the gospel without even mentioning the gospel. If you're going to serve in a leadership position in the church, you need to know how to apply the gospel to people's lives. Because they're looking to you for leadership. Not only must you know how to apply the gospel to people's lives, you've got to first know how to apply the gospel to your life. Again, we're talking about deacons, but this is good stuff for every Christian. Walking around talking about Jesus, but all people see is the world. In addition, in light of verses 8 and 9, Paul contends in verse number 10 that no man should be permitted to serve the church without first being tested. Verse 10 says, Then these men must first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Paul recognizes that there could be a flaw in the characteristics. You might come across a man who is a man of dignity. You might come across a person who is not double-tongued. You might come across a person who is not given to much wine. You might come across a person who is not interested in dishonest game. But the only way that you will know that the person is really who they are proclaiming to be is if they are tested. To be tested means to be examined. It literally means to be put in the situation that you are expected to serve. You don't have an official title yet, but we'll put you in the position to see how you handle yourself in it. What you are being is you are being tested. You are being examined. You, we are trying to see if you are handling yourself well with the duties that have been given to you. You can ask some people, can you do any job? And they will boldly confess, I can do any job. All you got to do is give me an opportunity and I'll get the job done. And then you say, okay, get on that and let me see what you got. And all of a sudden they found out this ain't for me. Paul says, don't you put anybody in a position without first testing them. Can I share with you why churches are struggling? It's because we are doing the opposite of what Paul commands. We are putting people in leadership positions who do not qualify for the position, but they look like they qualify. If you ever want to make me mad, just tell me you look like a preacher. How does a preacher look? You sound like a preacher. How does a preacher sound? So we're putting people in positions that they do not qualify for because they look like they qualify. They sound like they qualify, and then we put them in the position and they mess the whole thing up. They are honorable, they are admirable. People like to look at them, they like to listen to them, but they leave the same way they came because they look and sound good, but there's no substance into what they're talking about. All right. He says you need to test it. 
Timothy is a young man. And the hardest thing he has to do is make sure he's putting qualified people in leadership positions. Because Paul recognized that it's leadership that makes the difference. But these qualities and these characteristics, these attributes are first recognized by your community. Mm -hmm. If you're not this in your community, you can't be that in the church. But we wear different hats on. Y'all good right now. Put you in society. Somebody cut you off. Somebody cut you off in here, you're going to say, oh, excuse me, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Go ahead. But you get on 45, 16, 59, and somebody cut you off. <laughs> you like Peter. I know not the man. <laughs> Paul says, test them. Examine them. Watch them. One of the best compliments I ever got. From our old mentor, Pastor Kimball, looked at me once and he said, Son, I've been watching you. And I know that God has great things in store for you. You're handling yourself. You're somebody that people could want to look up to. So what the church did was they started testing me. That ain't what the, that ain't the word they used, but they started putting you up to speak on things. They, they started letting you teach Sunday school. They, they started watching how you handled yourself in the old situations and if you handled that well when you come out and say I think God is calling me to preach they say come on now okay. yes, sir. because we've been watching you we've been testing you to see how you handle yourself in different situations the churches are hurting because we don't do this we need some brothers on the front row so we just say come on and sit on the front row And the church has no respect for them. Mm. Mm -hmm. They don't follow them. They won't listen to them. It's leadership that makes the difference. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, test these men. Make sure that they meet the qualifications to be a leader inside of the church. In addition to being respected in your community, the text also teaches us that Christian, the people who qualify to care for the physical needs of a local church are Christian men who are respected in their home. Amen. You, are, you, you must be respected in your society, but you also must be respected in your home. In addition to social respect, Paul contends in verses 11 and 12 that Christian leaders are men who are respected in their homes. The text says, women likewise must be dignified, not Malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children in of their own household. Beginning with the wife, Paul contends that a deacon's spouse must be a reflection of him. Some people read this verse and they assume that Paul is speaking about women being deacons. The context of the passage does not support that Paul is talking about women being deacons, but he is talking about the woman who is married to a deacon. If you got a wife, brothers, you can't be one thing and she be another. She too must be Dignified. That is, she must be honorable. She must be admirable. Women ought to want to be like her. Amen. But you've been in church just as long as I have, haven't you? You know that there are churches where the church loves the preacher. They just can't stand his wife. <laughs> yes, sir. 
Can you stand that far? Yeah. Do you not know, brothers, that your wife can disqualify you for ministry? Amen. Mm -hmm. She can disqualify you. Hmm. Yes. It says she must be dignified too in order for you to serve. That's right. Yeah. That's what this word. I was dating a girl before Luke. I told her, God, I believe it's called me to preach. She said, Oh no. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know. her bad. skin had been kissed by nature so. She had the neck swinging and everything. Oh, I ain't doing no preachers now. And you see she ain't here. <laughs> it's because you know that your spouse can disqualify you for ministry. People get lifted up. My husband, the pastor. So what? You ain't. Come on. Tell Sit down me. and with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And they get full of pride and feel like they can do whatever they want to do and all this kind of stuff. Paul lets Timothy know if his wife is crazy, you got to sit him down too. <laughs> she must be dignified. Not Malicious gossip. Just talking. But during this time, it was very unattractive for a woman to talk. In fact, during this time, the only women who would do much talking was prostitutes. Because they had to advertise what they were selling. What do you say? Just to keep it better. <laughs> yes. So they would be the only ones who would talk a lot. Otherwise, a woman would try to get your attention by her beauty or her work ethic, the way she was dressed. But she wouldn't say nothing mm -hmm. unless you said something to her. We don't do that no more. <laughs> I went to the gas station the other day. Oh, uh -oh. And the girl was screaming. She saw a guy pull up in a nice Mercedes. The car was real nice. I was checking the car and upset myself. <laughs> and she lost her everlasting mind. She got to screaming and hollering, trying all in the man window. And I laughed from a good healthy place when the guy said, Excuse me, ma'am, I'm already spoken. Don't nobody want nothing like that. <laughs> you screaming and yelling and hollering and stuff. Back to my sermon. This is not malicious gossips. They just run around talking about people. Talking about everybody business but their own. They married to a man who's a leader in the church. In a minute, Paul is going to tell us why women must be this way. They must be temperate, and they must be faithful in all things. Be faithful in all things means that they should be dependable, reliable, trustworthy. They also must be temperate. They also must be temperate, honorable women, refraining from harming people with their words. Women can say hurtful stuff. Especially your wife. Because if anybody knows something about you, it's your wife. And if you make her mad enough, all your little secrets will come out. So get you about 10 years of marriage in and then start telling this story. Then you don't care. He says that they should also be different. They should not go around trying to harm people with their speech. Trying to say the most hurtful thing to people. Why? Because they are married 
to a man who's the leader of a church. The deacons must be the husband of only one wife. Yes, yes. Hear me, church. This does not mean that a deacon must be married. Neither does it mean that a preacher must be married in order to serve. However, it does mean that if he is married, he just needs one wife. It's a further implication of the idea that Paul is probably trying to press more here is that he ought not be engaged in fornication and or adultery. He must be the husband of one wife. And he must be a good manager of his children and of his own household. Do you see the home life? It's the wife, the children, and the household. A deacon, a man looking to lead in the church, has to be in charge of his wife, his children, and everybody who stays in his household. If you cannot control, it's probably a poor word to use. If your wife doesn't admire you, if your wife doesn't honor you, if your children do not honor you, if your the, the household part refers to servants or slaves or people who work for you, if they don't honor you or admire you, don't expect the Christian community to admire you once you get to the church. You don't demand respect at home, but all of a sudden you get to the church and you want to demand respect. Don't work like that. Your wife should be a reflection of you. She should see, if you are married, she should see that you possess honorable characteristics and she wants to follow you. She wants to submit herself to you. She wants to admire you. But if she sees nothing admirable about you, then she will not do that and the children will follow suit. If you want to be a leader in the church, there's nothing wrong with that. But make sure you got your house together first. Deacons must be the husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children. The point of leadership is evidence in the home. Now notice that the text speaks about children who live in your household. And once your children move out of your household, you don't have anything else to do with it. In the sense that they have no reflection on whether you qualify for ministry or not. But as long as they are in your household, you ought to, you ought to be able to have some influence over them where they want to be like you. Amen. Because they admire you. They look up to you. They think you're honorable. And they want to follow in your footsteps. But if your children don't want anything to do with you in your household, then why do you expect the Christian community and the church to want anything to do with you? Who qualifies to care for the physical needs of the local church? Christian man who are respected in their society. Christian men who are respected in their home. The last thing the text tells us in verse 13, that Christian men who are respected in their church qualify to be 
caretakers of the local church. Verse 13, Paul contends that qualified church leaders are men who are respected in their church. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Hear me, church. Deacons who are not respected by their church will not make a difference in their church. Christians who are, in, who are not respected by their church will not make a difference in their church. Preachers who are not respected by their church will not make a difference in their church. Amen. You get respect not because you have a position, but you get a position because you have respect. That's deep. I'll give it to you one more time. People do not owe you respect because you have a position. Uh -huh. But you should have a position because you already have respect. Isn't that how you got your job? You put in the application. And all they had to go on was your resume in your word. But you sat down in the interview room and you impressed them by using language that they understood. You, you spoke to them in a manner that gave them a respect for you. You earned their respect. And because you earned their respect, they gave you a position. You don't get respect because you have a position. You get a position because you have respect. When you have respect, the text says the church will exalt you. You don't have to exalt yourself. Amen. This is what it means when it says, for those who serve well as deacons obtain for themselves a high position. To obtain means to do what's necessary to get the position. You did everything.